Dave Altavilla and Marco Cipetta return to talk about some hot hardware, including a new SSD, affordable GPUs, the new NVIDIA Optimus, and more coming up. Try GoToMeeting free for 30 days. Visit gotomeeting.com slash tech podcasts. Dave, OCZ Vertex 2 Pro. I think either I had an aneurysm or I'm speaking gibberish or maybe it's an SSD. Could you explain what OCZ Vertex 2 Pro is? Yeah, I think you're uh, good to go with the latter conclusion, but uh, <laughs> there's no question one of the marketing guys was looking for like a triple word score or something like that with the, uh, with the branding on this product. Um, yeah, you know, it's like they, they, they strung together a whole bunch of techie sounding terms and, and uh, you know, named their SSD. But yeah, it's actually a new um, solid state drive from OCZ Technology, and these guys are, you know, coming out with what seems like a new SSD every other week. And uh, the hook here is it's got a new controller, uh, solid state memory controller on it by a company called Sandforce. And so it's actually um, a whole new controller. It's not by Intel. It's not Indolink. So these are all uh, solid state memory controller companies. Uh, these are, uh, this is a new player in the market, Sandforce, and uh, it's got some pretty good performance. So it, it's, it's fast? I mean, what's, what's, what's great about this thing? It's just, uh, <laughs> it writes fast, it reads fast, because SSDs have had some really weird things with read-write speeds. You could read really fast off them, but writing has been pretty awful. Uh, right. How's this, how's this faring? Yep, yep, that was a, an astute observation, and it's actually one of the strong suits of this controller and, and the architecture of the product uh, that SSD has put together with Sandforce. Um, Sandforce actually um, uh, compensates for what's called write amplification with their new controller, and um, traditionally um, the Achilles heel of, of solid-state uh, controllers is that, you know, they have to write uh, twice as much data uh, to the drive in order to actually write uh, a bit of valid data. It's a little bit more complex than that, but essentially there's an amplification of the data that's transferred in a write transaction. It does a read, it modifies the data, and then it writes it. And in that process, there's an amplification of that write data. And it turns out that not only do you get inefficient writing to the drive, uh, which actually you know affects the endurance and the life um, expectancy of the drive, but it also slows it down. So write performance has been a problem, and this controller uh, actually reduces that write amplification uh, to a fraction of historically what uh, you know the traditional or legacy controllers have been able to do in the market. That sounds pretty cool, Marco. I, I'm hearing that ATI has some new affordable GPUs. You know, affordable and GPUs; those words usually don't go together. Uh, what can these GPUs do, and what are the trade-offs for the price? So. ATI launched the uh, Radeon HD 5450 and Radeon HD 5570 all over the course of uh, you know the last week or so. They are you know DX11 class GPUs. They support Ifinity like the higher end cards, but these are half height products that are well suited to home theater PC applications. There is, however, you know a big performance trade off versus the higher end cards. The uh, the lower end 5450 basically can only do mild, low-res, low-quality gaming. The 5570 is much more powerful, um, but it's also the more expensive of the two, obviously. Well, how do they the fare, how do they fare uh, directly against each other? Is, is one actually almost double? The, I mean, thing, one is 89, and the other one's, you said 49 or 59? So one of them starts, uh, you know, it's like 49 to 59, depending on the configuration, and the other one is, uh, you know, 79 to 89, depending on configuration. Is the performance so, between the two, I mean, are they that far apart? Based on yeah, the it's, it, it, it's huge. The 5570 is sometimes, you know, twice or three times as fast, depending on the game. But as far as video playback performance, they're both, both pretty comparable. Oh, sounds pretty interesting. Dave, a trend in notebooks has been having integrated and discrete graphics in the same machine, but switching between modes has been pretty clunky. That is until the NVIDIA Optimus. First, could you tell the audience what that is and how your tests have gone with that? Optimus, it's, it's not a transformer. No, we know that much. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll save the... Um, the comedy show for uh, the day job. Um, anyways, uh, yeah, it's actually um, something that's pretty innovative. Um, historically, when you're switching from uh, integrated chipset graphics to a discrete graphics processor in a notebook, you'd have to toggle a button and the screen would go blank and you'd switch modes uh, to the you know, higher end discrete graphics processor, the GPU in, in a notebook that was enabled with it, you know, a higher end multimedia capable machine. Um, and the other thing you'd have to do in order to get into that higher end mode and or switch back would be to close 
Um, any application you're using that might be using a little bit of the graphics core, or even something like Solitaire would, would block the switching of those modes. And so it's clunky. It's, you know, a lot of times we found out that, you know, folks just left it in uh, low power integrated graphics mode with, you know, not very good performance just to preserve battery life. Um, but they certainly wouldn't get a very good multimedia um, or gaming experience out of the chipset graphics. Now, what NVIDIA has done with Optimus is to enable seamless switching um, into discrete higher-end uh, graphics modes with their graphics processors, in this case, a GeForce G210M is what we tested. And it allows seamless switching. The screen doesn't flicker. You don't have to toggle any buttons. It just senses when you have an application that's about to run and kicks it into high gear for you. So what kind of performance differences are we seeing? I think, I think I've seen some of the video actually at Hot Hardware. It's, I think, two frames per second to somewhere up to 20 frames a second. Is that the difference? What, what did you find? Yeah, I mean, NVIDIA likes to claim you could see, you know, especially with the GeForce uh, 210M, uh, the G210M, excuse me, uh, graphics processor, that, yeah, they can see anywhere from a 5 to 10x performance increase versus the integrated chipset graphics. Um, but, you know, the, and so, you know, that, that was kind of a known factor. But the problem is, is switching over to that higher end graphics mode and then switching back down automatically, which saves you that battery life when you need to save it and you don't need the horsepower, but kicks it into high gear when you do. And again, that's all via, you know, this Optimus technology. What's happening is the graphics processor, the NVIDIA graphics core, is actually talking to the Intel, in this case, integrated graphics processor and that Intel chip is still passing that data to the screen but it just switches which core is actually doing the work so it, it doesn't have to switch outputs it switches which engine and stays on the same output lines through that Intel chipset. Marco I hear you have some details on some new Intel processors including some that have six cores that sounds freaking awesome what's the word on that? <laughs> So we, we can't reveal all the details yet, you know, still under embargo, but uh, Intel did reveal some more details about their upcoming Gulf Town CPU, which is their uh, six-core uh, desktop processor. It basically, you know, a, a few weeks back, they released Clarkdale and Arendale, which are their 32 nanometer successors to, you know, based on the Hollum. Now, this is a 32 nanometer monolithic six-core CPU with 12 megs of cache and it fits in the same power envelope as the previous gen, you know, quad cores. So ultra powerful CPU with the same power envelope as the previous models. It's going to be a beast. Does that mean you can actually swap out a quad core for a six core? If you have an X58 motherboard and already have a high end core i7, they should just drop right in with a BIOS update on the motherboard. Wow, that's, yeah, a, that's a huge boost right there. Yeah. You know, Dave, Marco, I'm, I'm thinking we should give the viewers and readers something here. I mean, they watch the show, they, they read the site, they go to hothardware.com, every day it's their homepage. We should give them something. Maybe, maybe a computer. Think? Yeah, maybe even a gaming rig. Dave, can you hook that up? <laughs> Why, thank you. Uh, you're, you're teeing me up nice there, big guy. So, yeah, actually, this month we're having a Hot Hardware uh, Show Us the Love sweepstakes where we're going to actually give away another gaming rib, rig, excuse me, from uh, CyberPower. CyberPower PC, and they are donating a Core i7-920 uh, based gaming rig with uh, 6 gig of RAM and a solid state drive and a Radeon HD 5870 graphics card. Big time fun right there. That's and uh, free stuff. Wow, and you said an i7 in there, right? Yeah, Core i7-920, a 2.66 gigahertz Core i7-920 processor. Well, that sounds freaking awesome, actually. And that's it for this edition of Hot Hardware on TechV. Dave, Marco, thanks for all that info. You can find everything we talked about at hothardware.com. I'm Ayaz Akhtar, and we'll see you later.